Um, we're going to read the Bible together now, and we're going to start with Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with a harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully, shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth, he who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army, nor no warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. John chapter 1, reading verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray as we open God's word together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Light dispels darkness. Have you ever lit a match in a dark room? Whenever we have a family birthday, there's cake, of course, and someone always turns the lights off, and then you light the match, and the darkness goes. Darkness is pushed back by light. That's what Jesus does. Jesus says, I am the well, light of the run. world. Yeah, he brings light to our dark world. He pushes back the darkness. And for all the good things in the world, there's also great darkness, maybe in your world too. And Advent is a time to remember that there is light and there will be light. Advent is a time of waiting. Advent is about waiting for Christmas. 
when we remember and celebrate Jesus' first coming as a baby on that first Christmas day, but it's more than that. Advent is also about waiting to welcome Jesus' second coming because the first coming wasn't the end of the story. Jesus lived and died and rose again and he is now Lord of all and he'll return to judge. Over the next few weeks, we'll be spending time in John's Gospel looking at a selection of passages. And the theme we're going to be highlighting is that Jesus came as the light. Christmas means light. Jesus came to bring light to our dark world. I don't know how you feel about Christmas. For some, Christmas comes with a real sense of joy. For others, there's sadness. Maybe for you, there's just a frantic kind of focus on making sure everyone else has a good time. However you're waiting, Advent reminds us to wait with hope because the light has come. This morning, we'll be focusing on life because Christmas means the best life. Jesus brings the best life. But what does that mean? What does it mean to say that Jesus brings the best life? What does the good life look like? In Jervis Bay, many people will have a similar answer to that question. Uh, You don't live in the Bay and Basin if you hate the beach. The good life is all around us here, isn't it? We're living in it, enjoying the beaches, the bush, mountain bike riding, snorkelling. Or maybe the good life is raising your family with a slower pace of life or a quiet retirement surrounded by the beauty of nature. Jesus challenges our idea of the good life. He says he brings the best life. And so the question is, what does Jesus think the best life looks like? Turn with me to John chapter 1 verse 1. Uh, We're going to start here because John chapter 1 shows us why Jesus is qualified to answer our question. Why Jesus is able to tell us about the good life. The answer is because when life began, Jesus was already there. John's gospel begins in this way. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In the beginning. You hear that? John starts his gospel, this good news about Jesus, uh, and he starts it not with Jesus' birth. The story begins way before that. John takes us right back to the creation of the world, even before the creation of the world. In the beginning was the Word. The start of John's gospel echoes the beginning of the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 says... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you see, John says, in the beginning was the word. Genesis says, in the beginning, God. The hint is that the gospel, this good news of Jesus, brings a new beginning, a new Genesis, a new creation, a new recreation, a fresh start. More on that in a bit. But first, what is this mysterious word in John's Gospel? Well, John's Gospel was first written in Greek. And in Greek thought, the word is a kind of organising principle behind the world. But there's maybe more going on here. Because in the Old Testament world, word refers to the way God speaks and acts. It includes God's creative word. That is... It's by his word that God creates. In Genesis, all God has to do is speak and the world comes into being. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And on it goes. God speaks and by his word, the world comes into existence. The word in John's gospel is there at creation and he's the creator. Verse 3 says, through him all things were made. And the word who was with God was God, John tells us. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, the Word was and is God. The Word is intimately close to God. And this stretches our minds, doesn't it? It stretches language beyond how we normally use it. But what John is describing isn't normal. It's out of the ordinary. Uh, John comes to the point in verse 14 when he says, The Word became flesh. That is, the one who was there at creation, the one who was and is God, the one who is intimately close with God, that one became human. So if it stretches our minds and stretches our language a bit, we probably shouldn't be surprised. What's happening is out of the ordinary. The Word, as John says in verse 14, takes on human flesh in the person of Jesus. God the Son, who was there before creation, became human for us. And John, the author of the Gospel, is at pains to point out that Jesus is not part of creation. He's behind creation. He's creator, not created. Let me tell you about the time Santa threw a punch uh, with a little bit of help from AI. The name Santa Claus, I'm sure you know, has historical roots in the name Saint Nicholas. Nicholas was a bishop and the story goes that he attended the church council of Nicaea in AD 325. The big thing the council of Nicaea was investigating was the teaching of a man called Arius. And among other things, Arius taught that Jesus was a created human being, a created being. In Arius' view, Jesus was the first created being, so he was supreme over creation. But nevertheless, Arius was clear that Jesus was a created being. Uh, St Nicholas was there listening quietly, but in the end he couldn't take it anymore and he walked across the room and slapped Arius in the face. Now I'm not suggesting we should follow St Nick's lead here, but the point is Nicholas saw that what we believe about Jesus really matters. If Jesus was created, then he's not creator. If he's not creator, then he's not truly divine. When we affirm Jesus' uncreatedness, we affirm his godness. And because Jesus is creator, he knows how life works best. This is why we have instruction manuals, even if we don't read them. Uh, we know that the, the manufacturer knows how the thing works best. Jesus, the creator, knows how life works best. And so when it comes to the good life, the best life, we'll do well to listen to him. And there's something else to notice here. Uh, John is hinting that Jesus came to bring a new creation, a recreation, a new beginning. And that's because we need a new beginning. The world we have is not the perfect world that God made. Our sin, our rebellion against God has led to terrible consequences. And so the world we live in no longer looks like the world God made. On the first day of creation, God said, let there be light. But we see darkness. Where there was good, we see evil. Where there was perfection, we see brokenness. Not completely. By God's grace, there are still good things in the world to enjoy. The problem is when we keep enjoying those good gifts without giving thanks to the giver. Jesus came to fix the problem. He came to bring the best life. I've got a question for you to think about. You can talk to the person next to you as well. What's the one thing you couldn't live without? What's the one thing you couldn't live without? Maybe for you it's Vegemite on toast or your dog or your phone or maybe you're not as shallow as me and your mind goes to people. Uh, have a chat. So, what do, you, what do you think? What's the thing you couldn't live without? Or the person next to you, maybe what's the thing they couldn't live without? Trevor? 
Sandra. Good answer. Good answer. Sue? Washing machine and flushing toilet. In that order? Yeah. <laughs> what else? Jeff? Love and fellowship of Jesus. Absolutely. Some, did I hear someone say hair? <laughs> Cup of tea? Yep. Good answer. Jared? Paul said toilets. Yep. Excellent. Excellent answer. Hair. Air. Oh, air. I thought you said hair. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, lots of good answers there. The, uh, the truth is the list is endless, isn't it? Uh, because we are dependent. We can't manage by ourselves. We're dependent on lots of things. Where uh, Our existence depends on our parents. Without them, we would not be. Our existence depends on farmers and manufacturers and employers who pay us money and doctors who keep us going. Uh, even if you go off grid and grow your own food, you're dependent on God who sustains life and gives you every breath. We are dependent beings. But Jesus is dependent on nothing, no one. Turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 4. It starts with the words, In him was life. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Now, we might describe someone as the life of the party, uh, you know, someone who just walks into the room and they bring such energy, the mood lifts, it's fun. John is saying much more than that about Jesus. He's not just the life of the party, he is life. Jesus is the life giver. And he can be the life giver because he has life in himself. He's dependent on nothing, no one. Jesus has life in himself. That's a God thing. Uh, Tim Chester says, This is one of the things that marks Jesus out as truly divine. He is not a created being who depends on another for his existence. In him was life. Jesus came to offer full life now, the best life now. And it's not that life for the believer will be an easy path. There will still be suffering. We follow a suffering saviour and so we expect to suffer. Jesus came to offer full life, the best life, not an easy life. The full life means that God isn't a killjoy. He's not about making life miserable. He wants us to enjoy him. Jesus says he's the bread of life. He sustains life. It's in John chapter 6. And in John chapter 10, Jesus says he came to bring the best life has to offer. He says the thief came, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus says he came to bring us to the Father. The best life is one lived in connection with our Heavenly Father. John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The best life is in Jesus. Not just, not just the gifts of the Creator, but the Creator himself. Now we can still enjoy the gifts of creation, Enjoy the food he gives us, enjoy the, the boat, the bushwalk, whatever, but don't forget to enjoy the giver of the gift. John tells us his purpose in writing the gospel in John chapter 20. He writes that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The best life comes when we believe in Jesus and live for him. And the most important way Jesus brings life is because he gives us life in connection with the Creator, life renewed, restored, recreated. John 1 verse 4, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus brings life. 
The life he brings is light in the darkness, light in our dark world. And the darkness isn't just out there, it's in here. Sin affects our world and sin affects us. Do you remember the story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3? He's a Pharisee, he's one of the Jewish religious experts and he's obviously seen and heard Jesus and he's curious. So he comes to Jesus but he comes to Jesus at night so that no one sees him. The darkness tells us a bit about Nicodemus himself. It tells us about his failure to see, his lack of understanding. One author comments that Nicodemus becomes his own parable. Nicodemus says to Jesus, We know that you are a teacher who's come from God. And Jesus answers him, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus is a bit confused by that. And as they go backwards and forwards, uh, Nicodemus is asking and Jesus is answering. It's clear that Nicodemus doesn't get it. And so Jesus says in John 3 verse 10, You are Israel's teacher and do you not understand these things? And he goes on and condemns the unbelief of those who've seen and heard him but haven't believed. And then verse 19, Jesus says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Jesus points out that Nicodemus's problem is a darkness problem. The light has come, but people love darkness instead of light. There's an interesting footnote to this story. Uh, after Jesus' crucifixion, Nicodemus comes with Joseph of Arimathea and uh, they take Jesus' body to the tomb and Nicodemus brings with him myrrh and aloes to prepare the body for burial. It seems that Nicodemus has come out of the darkness and into the light, that he's seen Jesus for who he is and he's come to believe in him. The problem in our world is the same as the problem in our hearts. People loved darkness instead of light. And at the cross, darkness overcame the light. The light of the world was extinguished. Jesus died to pay the price for our sin, our darkness. And that means there's hope for us. If we see the darkness of the world, and if we're honest, the darkness of our hearts, then we need to hear this. Jesus died to pay the price for our sin, our darkness. And the story didn't end there, because three days later, Jesus rose again. And with Jesus' resurrection, God declares that the light will never really be extinguished. And that means that our hope is a sure hope. Darkness is defeated. Jesus brings the best life now because he's defeated darkness and he brings forgiveness of sins, a sure hope. And of course, Jesus offers life beyond this life. Jesus constantly reminds his followers that there is more to life than what they can see. There's more to life than just the experiences we have, the toys we collect, the assets we accumulate. Jesus gives us life beyond this life. In John chapter 3 verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Do you remember the story of Jesus and Mary and Martha and uh, the time where their brother Lazarus has died? And Martha speaks to Jesus and you can feel the anguish in her words. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. 
And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he raises Lazarus from the dead. Which is not a promise that Jesus will raise our dead here and now. Lazarus was the exception. But it points us to Jesus' power over life and death. And it points us to the resurrection hope that all believers have. Life beyond this life eternal life. Jesus brings full life now and he offers life eternal. In John chapter 5, Jesus heals a paralyzed man, but he's done it on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are grumpy about this. It's the Jewish day of rest. They're sticklers for rules. And so they pick him up on it. Jesus points out that God continues to work and he continues to work. God sustains the world. He keeps it going, even on the Sabbath. And of course, the Pharisees don't like Jesus equating himself with God. But Jesus doubles down. He makes the bold claim that God has given to him, to Jesus, the power to grant eternal life. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 24. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Do you hear the simplicity of that offer? Do you want life beyond this life? Do you want to pass through God's judgment? Do you want to go from death to life? Then believe, trust. Hear Jesus' words and believe God. Believe God's claim about Jesus' identity. Trust that Jesus is who he says he is. John says the darkness has not overcome the light. But that's not always how it feels. Does it sometimes feel to you like the darkness is winning? When we look at our world... The conflict, the hatred, the bitterness, it can feel like darkness is winning. When we look at our nation, we hear about violence, we hear about family strife, we see the brokenness of people, it can feel like the darkness is winning. But John says, the darkness has not overcome the light. That's the truth, regardless of how it might feel. And when Jesus returns, we'll see him reigning and ruling as king, and all the brokenness will be mended. All the darkness will be gone. Light dispels darkness. Light always wins. No matter how much darkness there is, if you strike a match or turn on a torch, the darkness is gone. Light always wins and what we remember at advent is that we're waiting we're waiting for that day when the darkness will be finally gone we're celebrating jesus first coming as the light of the world and we're looking forward to his second coming just as god said let there be light and there was light just as he created our good world Again, God has said, let there be light. And the light of the world has come. Jesus came and he brought a new creation, a recreation, getting rid of the darkness. And the best life is the life that's centred on him. Because the creator knows how life is meant to be lived. So this Christmas... We'll find the best life not under the Christmas tree, but in the manger. And the one who came as a baby at Christmas, who went to the cross and left behind an empty tomb. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, for his coming as the light, his death on the cross to pay for our darkness and his resurrection promising life and light to all who come to him. 
Help us to come to him and find the best life in him. Amen.